This is Peter Helland uh, today with David Wemhoff on Citizens for Community Media. And Dave is going to bring uh, to the table here uh, some interesting events, uh, speeches actually, that um, we're going to try to um, untangle. Um, I think you want to look at uh, Trump's UN speech, which was uh, about a month ago. And then you want to look at uh, Susan Collins' uh, speech on the Senate floor regarding the uh, nomination of Brett confirmation of Brett Kavanaugh. And then you want to look at the uh, feds are um, going after the, the, the priest in Pennsylvania. I think it's Harrisburg and um, Philadelphia. And then you want to look at uh, the issue of the rich white civil war. Okay, so we got these four subjects and you're going to be challenged to see how somehow this might fit together for some Something cohesive. Yeah, well, these are just current events. And so we're talking about current events. And, but let's see if we can connect the dots. Let's mm -hmm. see if we can see there's what's really going on behind all the talk and all the activity. And maybe postulate a few ideas as to what's happening. What do you say? Yeah, let's, let's look at it. And why would it be helpful to even do this? Is there, I mean, is there a, is there a reason why people should try to connect the dots? Absolutely. Because you want to know what's going on. You want to have... The truth. That's what you want to have, right? That's a big theme of yours, knowing the truth. In the 60s, uh, and some here in our audience, uh, it was K Pasa. So the, the, in the 60s, everybody wanted to know uh, what's happening, what's, what is actually uh, going on at the highest levels. I mean, that's where you lived. I mean, what's the buzz? Tell me what's happening. That was a song from the 60s, right? Yeah, that who's was Godspell who, or from Jesus Christ Superstar? Well, who's right? in charge? Who's controlling things? Uh, people, you, you instinctively want to know exactly what's going on. But what you have uh, oftentimes is you have demagogues. Demagogues, manipulators, people who manipulate people's ideas, their fears, their thoughts, their opinions, okay? And they're able to do that very effectively. And they may come in the form of some impartial scholar or blogger or chatterer. The whole chattering class is all a big part of that manipulation. They're a very important bit of social control in this society known as America. Okay. Now, for the people that don't know, you spent seven years working to uh, write a book, and the theme was how the CIA uh, infiltrated the Catholic Church to influence the Catholic Church to correct its doctrine to, to more comply with American ideology. Yes, and it also had the effect of changing the way the church leadership looked at the church. So the church leadership looked at America and said, that's the ideal. So therefore, their system of social organization is the best. And in May of 2016, Pope Francis said that. He said, confessional state doesn't work, got to go with the American model. So he rejected his own doctrine, okay? And that is, that is all throughout, really, the Catholic leadership. The Catholic leadership, the priests, the bishops, the cardinals, and, and the pope. But, but an important part of that social organization is the disestablishment of a church, but also freedom of the press. And that's protected in the Constitution, but the press is owned by private parties. Let me, let me interject a thought from way out here. I'm, I'm looking at the guy who was called the last of the church fathers, uh, Jacques Bossuet. And it, I was reading his biography. This is 16... 90 years, you know, those, those years, and I'm reading his biography, and he was appointed to the most prestigious position by the king, the most prestigious position you could get, which was a preceptor to the, to the dolphin. Do you know what that means? The dolphin. So that means that he worked for the guy who was next in line to be king. The oldest son, right. dolphin. You, yeah, okay. Delphin. So that was the highest position you get. So the king was diligent, and it was a, very diligent to pick the very smartest, best, godliest person in his kingdom to tutor his son for 10 years, to be with him, mentor his, his oldest son. Was that Louis the Fourteenth, Or Louis the Thirteenth? Yeah, it was Louis. The Louis. It, it had to be Louis. <laughs> it was Louis. <laughs> but just think about it. They, they, they were so concerned that the oldest son got the best of the best training 
to be the optimal best king possible. Well, what was that training in? Well, this is theology. I mean, it was pure theology. I mean, Bishop of, I'm not good at French, but he was Bishop of Mainz, and they said he was the best orator behind the pulpit of the whole Christian church ever. So are you saying then that France was trying to organize its society along the lines of a theology? Absolutely. Completely. I mean, the king was to be formed by the greatest theologian that they could find. But that didn't work. Did it? Because in 1790... It was 100 Peru, years before that, though. They got th- overthrown. 100 years, but yeah, but within, yeah, after 100 years, yeah, they did get overthrown. But, but, but that goes back to the... We have our model of government that the person we put in has nothing to do with the type of person they were concerned about having. Somebody totally uh, trained to be a, a Christian, a real Christian. Well, I think in the American system, it's a pluralistic system. So you got to have, you can't have the government and the pol- public policy based on any one set of religious beliefs. Yeah, but the problem is, when the Bible says pray for, it says first of all, before all things, pray for all men and for kings. It's like your highest duty is to pray for the king. It says king, that they, of course, would be, have the mind of God. And do the right thing. So are you saying democracy is against the Bible? And a republic form of government is against the Bible? You're saying then that the monarchy is divinely ordained by God? Is that what you're saying? No, I wouldn't go that far. But hmm. uh, Saul was taken off from being king, removed from being king, mainly because he listened to the voice of the people. God had said, kill all the animals, and the people said, no, I'll spare some. So he listened to the voice of the people, which it parallels Adam listening to Eve's voice. Or well, voice of the people, isn't that a, a column in the South Bend Tribune? It is. But the voice of the people becomes the voice of God. Eve's voice became the voice of God for Adam. So that's a, that's a really bad thing. Well, that's kind of scary. I mean, you're saying one guy is hearing God's voice, but the rest of the people can't hear his voice, God's voice. Could that be a, a form of mania or insanity? No, they, they, they got Jacques Bossuet was appointed by the king to tutor his oldest son, which they call what? Dauphin? How do you pronounce the Delphin. it? Oh, Delphin. Okay. And because they wanted the future king to be able to know God's word, God's voice. So he was only trained to follow that voice. And the idea would be God would bless their kingdom, that it would be the right thing only to obey God, not the voice well, of the people. Well, here it's not the, the right South thing. Bend Tribune voice of the people, but right, okay. So anyway, so I'm so we're looking at these speeches, and these speeches are 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 what they're reflecting the voice of. I mean, how do you know if a speech is right? How do you know if, if they're saying the right thing? Well, that's up to you. That's up to every individual in this society to decide if it's right or wrong. And then you're given the franchise. You're given the ability to vote as you see fit. Yeah, but what happens if the people are completely listening to the wrong voice? The, well, voice of, the, the voice of the serpent in Eve's case, the voice of the devil. Well, that's a theological argument. But what you've got is you've got a society that has a remarkable resiliency, a remarkable ability to correct itself when there are problems. Right? There's, we have all this sexual abuse stuff that's been going on, but it's correcting itself. You have all this fraud on Wall Street, but it's correcting itself. So, I mean, you're talking about, you know, you're talking about what? You're talking about public policy? Well, certainly there was a decision that came in from the Supreme Court saying you can listen to religious viewpoints, but not everybody shares your religious viewpoint. Okay, well, look, let's look at Susan Collins' speech. Okay, now she's, she's arguing... Um, and I've listened to her speech, and I've read her speech, and she's arguing that, hey, don't be worried about Kavanaugh. Uh, he's about as liberal as we would want. And in fact, um, Obama had pointed uh, Garland, I think. Merrick Garland. Merrick Garland, right. and he would have been the fourth Jewish person on the Supreme Court, which is interesting. But that's typically a liberal point of view. And so, so Obama did appoint somebody that, that we would have thought was very liberal, whereas Kavanaugh is the Catholic. See, normally there's this liberal versus conservative. And Kavanaugh, according to Collins, 96, I think, percent of their voting record was exactly the same. 
Well, and so what that points out is 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 the fallacy in your argument. Okay. Okay. The, the argument's wrong. You know, the, you said that Catholics are opposed to Jews. That's not true. That's simply. I'm saying not generally, true. generally speaking, Jewish people are liberal. No. And Catholic people tend to be more conservative. No, I, I don't agree with that at all. That, what you just cited to in Susan Collins' speech is to say, here are these two guys from two different faith traditions. They vote the same way. So being Catholic or being Jewish in America doesn't matter. Apparently not now. I it, mean, no, that's what, it doesn't matter. That's what's so amazing is that she's pointing out that you would have thought that Kavanaugh was conservative but, and Garland was liberal. By but, them, by uh, a clue would be one was Jewish and one was, uh, but but by, on the actual facts, so, they're pretty much the same. Right. So her what her what her speech is saying, she, she's saying these guys, you know, um, Brett Kavanaugh and Merrick Garland were of the same jud- judicial point of view as far as the laws go, as far as the precedent and the laws, and as far as what is allowed under the Constitution and what isn't. She's saying they're the same. They're the same viewpoint. So that that causes several. Sh- Questions who arise in our minds. Okay, that's what that should cause. Several questions. One, um, what was so big about the whole Kavanaugh confirmation process? Well, you got to listen to what Brett Kavanaugh said. Now, it was a very impassioned discussion he had uh, when they gave him a chance to come back on September 27th and talk. He came back. He was very impassioned, very emotional. And he said, you know, uh, basically, this is a Clinton hit job on me because he was involved with Ken Starr and he was involved with the Vince Foster investigation. Yeah, that could be. There's there's some merit to that position. You know, uh, no pun intended on Merritt Gallon's name, but... I think it's Merrick, actually. But no, that, there's a good point. Maybe that's what it was about. Was it really about conservative versus liberal in light of Susan Collins' speech? No, not really. But what it did happen was you had this giant galvanization of the sides again. Okay? And what's that doing? That's driving people to the polls to vote. Driving people to the polls to vote. Well, why does it? I mean, you, you said this before. Who? Let, let me. Let me. Okay. okay. No, no, no. Let me interject real quick. It's not about sex. I know everybody wants to think everything's about sex, but it isn't about sex. Kavanaugh is not about sex. The confirmation was not about that. I mean, sex was the the hook that kind of brought you in, you know. Oh, there was a sexual assault, you know. But really, it's it's not about sex. But anyways, it's about getting people involved. But anyways, yeah. But you're saying. They think it's important that people get involved. The average person doesn't care if, if they get involved. They don't think it's important that, that it all hinges on people going to the voting. That's, that's well, only an elite group is, that's concerned about that. Well, maybe. well, look, here's the thing. This is interesting what you say, because a lot of people for a long time didn't care about voting. And what they're saying now is they're saying it looks like the turnout is going to be as high as it was in the mid-1960s. Why do they have to have a high turnout? Who cares if there's a low turnout or a high turnout? It makes no uh, difference. Who cares? It's very important. Who cares? Okay, that's very who cares? important. The average person doesn't care if it's a high or low turnout. Who does care? In your mind, who do you think cares that there's a higher turnout? The one-tenth of one percent. They are. They want and, a high turnout, and they are of all faiths and all non-faiths and all ethnicities. You're talking about the wealthy ethnicities. Right. Talking to the one tenth of one percent, the people with the real power in the society. That's right. They, for some reason, you, how do you know that? And and you're guessing that they're concerned about a high turnout. No, I don't guess. These are these are educated analyses. Based on, tell on me why you think studying. they're. Tell me why you think they're concerned. Because you've got to have people voting. That shows the system is legitimate. That shows that people think that democracy and voting and the popular will is something that's real and should be reckoned with. And when people don't vote, yeah, people withdrawing from the system. The system doesn't look so legitimate, does it? Okay. Its decisions don't look so legitimate. So this is about increasing the legitimacy of the system. Despite what the mainstream media is saying, this has actually increased the legitimacy of the system, particularly in the sense of voting. Now, what has become preeminent is the primacy of politics. But the beauty in politics is basically people liking one thing or another you know, getting involved for one cause or another. But the beauty and the brilliance of Susan Collins' speech, and it was a brilliant speech, is that it was an attempt to bring everybody together in the sense of, look, we can disagree, but, you know, we all kind of agree on the same principles in this society. Okay, legitimate. Now, the only thing I can think of 
that parallels it a little bit. Um, I've been watching. I, I saw this is this is uh, uh, another example from coming from from afar. But there's they're interviewing Brett Farr. He was the Packers uh, quarterback, and Brett Farr is saying concussions, concussions. I mean, you're getting a con you're getting concussions all day long now. And I didn't realize it. He's saying, he said he wouldn't let he doesn't want his grandsons necessarily playing. Okay, so. They're saying that football could be on the way out because if the parents don't want their kids risking a concussion, so I'm seeing them glamorizing, you know, you know, they, they, these games come up and they, oh, they push these games. You know, they want people to keep interested in these games. Yeah. They, they make them more exciting interested. than what they are. They have to keep interested. And I, and I want to I refine something I said a little earlier together on Susan Collins. The brilliance of her talk was that she, she reinforced the legitimacy of the judiciary is what she did. That was the brilliance of it, okay? Because she said, look, these guys, you may think they're from different political points of view, but they're going to support the same things. What that also shows is that being Catholic, being Jewish, doesn't really mean anything in America. It just, it just doesn't. But what does matter is that you accept a certain ideology, the ideology of liberalism, which is listening to the voice of the people, not the South Bend Tribune voice of the people, necessarily, but the voice of the people, you know, you listen to what is the voice of the more important people, which is the one-tenth of one percent. Why is sex such a big deal? Why are we always talking about, you know, uh, Harvey Weinstein and the sexual abuse crisis here, or sexual abuse crisis and the Me Too movement? Why is that so big? It's being prompted, promoted by the media. The media is privately owned, okay? So what you've got is you've got this this powerful, this is support for what I've said before, these powerful private interests who set the agenda, and everybody dances to that tune. That's what the Kavanaugh hearings also showed. And so, and so why, do you, why are they interested in pushing this, the sexual um, issues? Because it distracts people and at, from the real issues and gets them involved in the system. It gets them to listen. And now they're listening. Oh, boy, now I'm going to go vote. So people are saying, Joe Donnelly voted against Kavanaugh. I'm going to go vote against Joe. And that's that's how it works. Okay, what about this question? And you may have to recuse yourself on this question. But there's a, there's a check and balance in our system, legislative, judicial, and the executive. And I, if I'm wrong, I could be wrong, but I thought one state actually didn't allow a, a lawyer to be in more than one. Okay, so I don't know. you got Collins. A lot of these people could be lawyers, right? So they're, you know, and a lawyer is an officer of the court. So you got the, the, the executive uh well, Trump is obviously not a lawyer, but, but Obama was. And you got the judicial. Most judges were prior were lawyers, probably 90%. And then you have the uh, legislative. I think it, it, there's an ebb and flow, but maybe half at one time were lawyers. So does that say anything to our system from your point of view? Does that say she may be a lawyer herself, Collins, and so she's defending the judicial system. I mean, it's, it's up her alley to do that. Well, you're dealing with a political system that's based on a, on a written constitution and the, the laws that interpret it. So what you have is you get a lot of people uh, at laws and court decisions that follow from it. But so you have a lot of people who want to get involved to, um, you know, do something about the system. They're interested in the system. They kind of know how the laws and uh, the decisions work, and so they want to get involved. And so that's why I think a lot of them get involved. That's where you get lawyers. Another way to put it is a lot of these people are system system people. They're, they're system guys. They're there to, to make things happen. Um, you know, you got top management, middle management, lower management in every organization, in every society. That's what you got. Well, the guys who call the shots in America are, are really the guys who are able to harness the great wealth. That's really them. And that's a very small uh, percentage of people, guys and gals, but it's a very small percentage of people. Gustavus Myers was a very well-known writer. Um, he lived from 1872 to 1942. Uh, he wrote a book in 1910. Um, actually, he wrote a series of books beginning in 1910, I think it was to 1914, about the great fortunes uh, of America. And I'm paraphrasing him now. In 1910, he wrote, he said, you know, we have all these different, all of these different factions, and they're sincerely, these people sincerely hold these beliefs, and they get involved in politics of all stripes, you know, whether, whether the lawyers or businessmen or, or, or housekeepers or construction workers, whatever. They're, they're involved, whatever their religion is, whatever their socioeconomic status, they're involved. They fight over the issues of the day, 
But what he said that was most interesting, and I just came upon this quote just a few days ago. What he said was most interesting is that, but the fundamental basis of society, the fundamental structure of society remains unchanged. Yeah, of this society. Of this society remains unchanged. Yeah, okay. And That's what, right. And what did he say was the fundamental... Well, you, you have powerful private interests that basically call the shots. You know, there was a movie a few years ago called The 300. You remember that movie? It was with the Spartans. Oh, now I, I, think, I think the viewers are going to like this. <laughs> like half-clad men, you know, running around in this, in this, in this movie, um, which, you know, was a horrible movie, I think, in a lot of ways. But there was a movie made about 45 years earlier from that called The 300 Spartans. And that was actually a very well-made movie. It was filmed on location at Thermopylae. Um, and it starred uh, Richard Egan, who was Leonidas. He was the king of Sparta. He led the 300 Spartans and some other Greeks up to Thermopylae, and they fought at Thermopylae and were slaughtered by the Persians because they were trying to stop the Persians from taking Greece. And then the head of the Athenians was a guy by the name of Themistocles, okay? And he was played by Sir Ralph uh, Richardson, uh, Sir Ralph Richardson, a British actor. And there's one, there's one scene where... Leonidas and Themistocles are arguing with the Greek city-states in uh, some place, um, you know, that looks stately, and they're and they're arguing and they're saying, you know, we all need to come together and we need to fight the Persians. And so they finally won everybody over, but it was after a real long discussion, and it looked like they were going to lose, right? So uh, Leonidas leaves the room, Themistocles leaves the room, they go sit down by the fountain, and, and, and Themistocles says, oh my gosh, we almost lost that thing. I can't believe it, but now we're united, we're going to fight together as Greeks, we can beat the Persians, I know it. And then Themistocles says the most interesting thing ever said in a movie, especially for 1962, he said, you know, people are so much easier to control once they have their say That's very important. So what the system allows you to do is everybody gets to have their say. Everybody gets to have their cause and their issue, okay? And they all go, you know, struggle with each other. That's great. That's wonderful. But the guys who own the amphitheater, they're still in power. Nothing changes. That dynamic is still there. There's no fundamental change. There's no check on their power. There's no real check on the government's power with a state church or a state religion, which is what I think the Catholic Church saw um, over the centuries. Um, but that's what you have, and that's what Gustavus Meyer saw. Now, he didn't look at it in the religious terms, but he didn't write my book either. But he wrote his own books, which they look very good. I plan on reading them. So are we saying that um, the, the people in America worship money? I mean, are we, I mean no. is, it, is it the money no, that I, gives you the, and no, that Americans I, worship money? In America, you can <clears throat> truly be what you want to be. True, but what do people tend to do? What do people in America tend to value they, the they, most? They, they can do all sorts of things. They value success. Yeah, but, but yeah, but what's the definition of what's America's definition of success? Is it well? It's a lot. Is of it things. that you made a lot of money? Is that the definition? It's a lot of things. Last night, Garth Brooks was in was in the Notre Dame Stadium. Were you there? I heard about it. You didn't go. <laughs> No, I didn't go there. No. But, but, I mean, it was packed, and you can see all the Facebook, YouTube stuff. You know, it's just snow on the field. It was terrible. No, it's success. Is Garth Brooks a multi-billionaire? No. But, but he is at the top of his field. America does reward talent. You do have to have talent. That's right. And you can, you can use that talent to advance socially and economically in the arts, or you can just sit home and look at YouTube videos and write crappy comments. That's what it allows you to do. That's what America allows you to do. And that's the reality. So what people tend to gravitate towards is success. Whatever that is, maybe get elected to office, maybe make $100 billion, maybe come up with a new business idea, maybe you write a great book. Is, is um, uh, you know, Michael Crichton or um, the guy who, I'm sorry, the guy who writes the law books, um, Griffin, Gritchen, I mean, are, are these guys multimillionaires? Maybe they are, but they're not particularly wealthy. They just are very talented in what they do. Well, okay, but let's just, just get, get, make it very real. The, the, People follow you because you're on TV repeatedly. Okay, that's a sign of success. That's the truth. Well, if they're following you to be entertained, that is not a sign of success. Okay, okay. so the, the early church fathers, if you could get them together and say, give us the best definition of success from your perspective as, as church doctors of the church, they come up with their definition. 
then let's come up with the, uh, the accepted American definition of success that you're talking about. You use that it's word. A, it's a material success. It's a material success. Okay, so being successful for an American is material success. Being successful for the early Christians, their concept of success, are you saying are, is radically different? Radically I, I, different? I don't know what the early Christian sense of success was. Well, then there's, I, there's I, two definitions I, for I, success. I, you're, you're saying you're saying there's a Christian definition of success that's different from the American. I don't yes. know. I'm just saying that there's an American system of success, which, which you said is which is, is mammon is, based. Is, no, I said it's material. Mater, what's the difference between materialistic and money or mammon based? Mammon is wealth. You can you can <laughs> succeed materially. You could write great novels. You could have a TV show that's running, but you may not have a lot of money. I mean, the money will flow. But you're primarily there because of some talent you exhibit. Athletes. These guys are great athletes. They're successful. Yeah, Peyton Manning's very successful. He's, he probably has millions of dollars. So you're saying that's a material, that's that's material success. Yes, it's a material success. Okay, but isn't, people want people who win elections, you know, but who are at the same time provide value and they do it with a sense of genuineness and integrity. That's it, how it works. You've heard people accuse somebody of being a materialist. What's a, what's a materialist in your mind? When you hear that word, what well, do you, what do you, could you use the word? So well, what is your concept of a materialist? Well, materialist. Material success, a materialist. Well, ma materialist can mean material success. It can mean somebody who's, who's fixated, you know, on the worldly. It, it, it could mean somebody who's practical. I mean, all those things. Americans are practical. The American people are practical. The leadership of the American people is practical. That's why their minds, the minds of Americans, are very facile. They're able to, to accept and deal with a lot of concepts. And that brings us into Donald Trump's speech to the United Nations on September the 25th. Okay. He got up to the United Nations, and what does he talk about? What does he talk He talks about, we're opposed to globalism. We're standing for America, the American people. We're standing up for the world. Okay. And what he says, he says, everyone is the emissary of a distinct culture, a rich history of people bound together by ties of memory, tradition, and the values that make our homelands like nowhere else on earth. And then later on, he says, America's policy of principled realism. Okay? Um, this guy's smart. He's a very smart man. Um, but what he's basically saying, he is recognizing that there is this universal individualism that I've talked about before, which can apply to everybody around the globe. But then also, too, there's this idea of the country, of a unique people. So you, as we've talked about before, you've got this ideology, which is universal individualism, and then you've got what I term the natural law, which is where people tend to, like, inhabit the same area and they tend to like hang together, you know, for whatever reason, and they, they want the survival of that group. But these two things are in conflict right now. So what Trump is doing, what President Trump is doing, is very smart. He is appealing to this idea of the natural law that we are a group, you know, somehow we're a group. And, and that's questionable whether there is one group of people in America, but he's appealing to this, this idea of a group, which appeals particularly um, I think to certain groups in America, he's got, as I've mentioned before, he's got a real certain following, I think, with a lot of white Americans. And so he uses that to keep this idea of universal individualism afloat, the principles of the American Revolution and of liberalism afloat. That's how they use it. That's the that's the principled realism that the American leadership has always exhibited and always used. They're incredibly facile, and they're able to adjust, and they're able to use what's there, and they're able to take the Constitution and and see how it can be a giant shock absorber for when there are stresses in the system. Okay. So a lot of people are trying to say that Trump is conservative. I mean, the people that hate Trump, okay? Because right now you got people that love Trump and people that, you know, he's the Antichrist, or, you know, or he's the... Oh, yeah, no. Okay, right. but... And that's driving people to the polls, isn't it? That's driving people to go vote, isn't it? But is he conservative? Because he used to be a Democrat. <clears throat> How would you, would you, is he even definable? Can you say, personally, if he's liberal, is he conservative? Or uh, Those terms don't apply here? Well, no, he, he, plays to, <clears throat> he plays to the conservatives, but he's still ultimately advancing a liberal agenda with a capital L. He's ultimately advancing this system of social organization that is America. Because if Kavanaugh and uh, 
What's his name? Uh, Garlic? Mer- Merrick, Merrick Garland. Merrick Garland. You're starting to slur the two together here. <laughs> okay. Garland, Garland Merrick. But you have the idea that Trump is very opposite of Obama, and then whoever Obama picked uh, has to be totally different than whoever Trump would pick. But then Collins, in her speech, is pointing out there's hardly any difference between them. There's hardly them. any difference when it comes down to interpreting the laws and, and, the and their decision making. They, and their decision making. He has no intention of overthrowing anything that's gone before us. No. No. So what's all the hoopla then when they're basically both the same? Well, that's right. What is all the hoopla? <coughs> well, the hoopla is to get people involved in the system. So you got to come up with something salacious or you got to throw the sex card out there. Maybe we should have a sex card we can throw during this to make sure people watch us. But, you know, you got to throw the sex card out there. And so people turn it on and they, they got to pick sides. Oh, I feel sorry for, for Dr. Ford. Oh, I feel sorry for Judge Kavanaugh. <laughs> you know, and then they say, oh, those Democrats. Oh, those Republicans. Then they got to go out and vote and nothing's going to change. Okay, the system remains the same, but they go out and vote, and people are involved in the system. Okay, but but the average person is not aware that they need everybody to they they want people to be voting. The average person would, wouldn't pick up. Well, who cares if we got ten percent of the people that vote or ninety percent? I don't think the average person the, gives it much thought. You know what's the average person? I don't know. People people want security. They want meaning in their life. They want, they want work. If they want a family, they want to be able to take care of the family. These are basic things, you know. Um, you know, more and more self-actualization, you know, doing what you want to be able to do. And uh, that's their interest. And the beauty of the American system is that it is a liberal system, capital L. It, it, there is no constriction on the mind of man except what you want to put on it, as, as, um, uh, as Thomas Jefferson said as in the Monticello Monument there in Washington, D.C., you know, um, you want to put a restriction on yourself, you can do that. Go ahead and do it. But otherwise, you can actually do what you want. You can achieve that material success or no success at all. It's up to you. But what you have is are these two sides, and it looks like it's tearing the country apart, doesn't it? But the country is, the country is, is very resilient. The ideology is very resilient. The Constitution is very resilient. You know, people are saying, oh, Roe versus Wade is going to get overthrown. It's going to get overturned. We're going to have a, ah, oh, we're going to go back to back alley abortions. Eh, it gets overturned. It's going to go back to the states. And then you got the states fighting it out. But you keep the union together. But is it going to get overturned? Can you really overturn Roe versus Wade? No, probably not. Because if you overturn Roe versus Wade, then... Griswold versus Connecticut's got to go. Ooh, and if you do away with contraception, then you're really changing the way people live their lives. And um, this system is based on people, um, the individualism uh, of people really being given a premium. And part of that is being able to do what you want sexually. I threw in the sex card. That's going to increase viewership. (laughs) Um, Okay, going back a little bit. You have uh, definitely pushed that the ideal would be a state church, and of course, uh, you were. Well, well you're, no, you're... I'm saying that was the Catholic doctrine. That is the Catholic doctrine, as I understand it. Yeah, Catholic doctrine has always been you have a state church, and um, that's even um, the natural law, as the Catholic priests back in the 50s and 60s wrote about. The natural law says you got a state church. It might be Zeus, and might be. Yahweh, it might be Buddha, it might, you know, pick somebody. But that has always been the way in in human societies, except America. America but is I, a break. Till, uh, So that's the, the most that's a radical thing radical. about the American experiment was I up, think it is. up till America, yeah. people always felt that they had a duty to acknowledge right. um some their deity. God. They had, to, they had to proclaim their God. Right. That was part of the natural law, but it also had practical ramifications. It dealt with power. You go all the way back to ancient Egypt. You had the pharaoh and you had the high priests. Well, guess what? Those guys would fight sometimes. The high priest would check the pharaoh. The pharaoh would check the high priest. But there was a check against the government. Okay? But that was the established religion was the cult of Amun-Ra. Okay? But it's been that way all through history. The Greeks said, you know, one of the purposes of government is to protect, you know, the temples to the gods and, and encourage this worship of the gods. The Romans did the same thing. Okay. Well, just just on a practical level, I mean, I, I'm five years old. It is o- practical, right. I'm five years old, and I lived in, you know, in town, and there's the park. And you'd go to the park at age five, and you'd meet guys that were 10 years old, 8 years old, you know, and you had to, you know, reveal to them who you were. They wanted to know who you were. 
And in this, a park. I, you know, I, this is sounding a little strange. Okay, but I'm um, just saying this is back in the 50s. Okay, but the point I'm okay. getting at is people wanted to know, in, in the scripture, you know, like you were the son of, you know, Dave Wemhoff, but you were known as through your father. Okay, you're the son of him. But then on top of that was, even this is like might be in a movie, who's your God? So you wanted to know who's your dad, is your identity, and then who's your God? Now, even then, even in the primitive way, we were Lutheran and Catholic. So I mean, even if we got down to it, we would like, okay, like we might even argue about bap- meaning of baptism, even at age five and six. Yeah, yeah. Well, that was very unique. But also, too, you have the dynamic of two different groups of people defining God differently, don't you? Catholics define God differently than Lutherans. Oh, yeah. My Lutheran friends went right. to the Lutheran school. So I might be friends with them up till age six. But then, boom, they, I didn't see them. Because they went to Lutheran school. But we would even, I remember discussions on that, you know, oh, I know more about God than you do. See, and that was a community. Those religions formed community. But you also see these, these, these folks in these different communities defining their own God. That's also in the First Amendment, is it allows you in America to have your own definition of God and reality. That was Casey versus Planned Parenthood, 1992. Okay? You can define God, the deity, the purpose of life, however you want. That's part of this system. That's all part of it, folks. That and the ability to be creative... And to express your individuality, whether you're writing or blogging or, or talking on this radio show or TV show like we got now, that's all part of the same cloth. And people don't understand that. But until America, every nation proclaimed who their God was, and that's, that's almost innate. Who does America say its God is? Who do we say? We're silent on it, or do we just say materialism no, is our no, god? No, no, no. Yeah, yeah. Money's it's, it's our an god. It's individual choice. You worship your own god. So I'm on Facebook, right? I look at Facebook. Okay, I probably shouldn't tell people this, but I look at Facebook, you know. And I, and I got friends, you know, and they post stuff, and you see what they post. And so here's the the typical Catholic viewpoint. It's a total Americanist viewpoint. Okay, this guy posts something. It's some paper from the. Um, some flyer from the parish priest in a local Catholic parish, right? And, of course, it's, fl- it's flawed to begin with. The, the, the flyer's flawed to begin with. It says, you know, the, these things are, in Catholic doctrine are, are, uh, are not negotiable. Abortion, contraception, euthanasia, let's see, what was another? Gay marriage, and there was a fifth one. I can't remember what it was. But it all had to do with the sexual stuff, right? And all that, playing the sexual card again, could get more people in this. But it all had to do with the sexual stuff, right? Okay, so this guy was irate, and he says, I don't understand how they can tell me how to vote. I go to church to worship. Thomas Paine, I thought I was reading Thomas Paine. I said, Tom, is that you? But it wasn't. It was oh, I mean, he's else. complaining about maybe people at church telling him how to vote? The pastor was telling him how to vote. He said, you can't tell me how to vote. Well, you know, and, and I'm just going there to worship. Well, Thomas Paine said, church is there to worship, and you don't interfere with that. Okay, and Thomas Paine is very important to the founding of America. Which you also had in America in the 1960s, as, as detailed in my book, which parts right now I do not recall, but, but it was a detail in my book about how the Puerto Rican bishops in October of 1960 said, hey, can't vote for these candidates, they're bad. And oh, the American press just got lit up on that. Oh, you can't, Catholics, you can't, Catholic bishops, you can't tell the flock how to vote. Well, this is the same thing, see? This guy has internalized, he has accepted the American view, and he has rejected his own church teaching, his own church Well, leadership. that's what Kennedy, Kennedy gave that up. Right, in, he in gave to, that up in, in September get, of 1960. Right, right, in order to get elected, he said... Exactly. So, one guy posted, it was a real simple post, he said, why can't the bishops tell us what the moral issues are? They have a duty to. They have a duty to. So um, this is what you're seeing right now. You're seeing, you know, a flawed premise dealing with all these sexual issues, you know, and then you're seeing people saying, oh, you can't tell me how to vote. And it's just a mess. It's just a mess. The Catholics have become the biggest supporters of the American system, the biggest promoters of it around the world. And I've talked about that before, but nothing's changed. However, what has changed is in Pennsylvania. Right, right. In other words, to close that up, in other words, it's saying, in my mind, the Catholics have internalized the American definition of success at odds with the traditional definition of success for a, a good Catholic. That's how I would say it. Well, I, I think a lot of Catholics 
But maybe you're right. I, I don't I don't know what the traditional Catholic version of success is. The early church fathers, I mean, well, you know, how they define the what, what, what was it? What was their definition? What? That, that renounce the world, you know, renounce pursuing ambition world. and fame were, were evil. I mean, you renounce the world. You uh, you aim for the... So, so what, you live in a cave? No. You live I, in a cave, don't get medical aid, you just die, you know. They're defi- you, you don't wash. I mean, renouncing the world, man. Monasteries were big, and monasteries promoted the kingdom well, more than anything I mean, else. I, well, see, I think this is a real <laughs> issue. Uh, uh, you know, you're saying, you know, you got to renounce the world. You're now what? You walk away from the world then? I mean, is that is that what they said? You just walk, let it let it handle itself? No, I, I don't. If if that's what Christianity teaches, then there's a real issue here because because then the Christians are going to just simply retreat, and everybody else is going to have the field, so they got nothing to complain about. That's number one. Then the second thing is, if you renounce the world, I think you open the gate for a lot of mental illness, frankly. Because I think you're, as a human being, you have a body, and you know Catholics teach you have a soul. So um, you got these two things, and so if you're going to put them at odds with each other, I don't think that's a good thing. So what you want to probably do is find a way where the body and the soul can be integrated in daily life so that it's positive. And maybe the church did that at one time with many of its doctrines, but nobody follows the doctrines anymore. So now, you know, it's pretty much um, everybody's going to go to heaven. So don't worry about this. Just go to church once in a while and uh, don't do certain things and you'll go to heaven. And let your conscience be your guide. Let your conscience be and be sincere. Be sincere. So this is what has taken the place. The church, you know, once again, the leadership of the church has just abysmally failed. They fail to adhere to their own doctrine, which is a rejection of Christ. I mean, the leaders have rejected Christ. And in doing so, they've really hurt uh, the flock and the members. But that's the way it is with every organization sociologically. If you are the president of, of Starbucks coffee and you start Starbucks coffee and then you, have, and then you quit and your successor comes in, he says, we're not going to sell coffee, we're going to sell soda. You know, but we're going to have the coffee signs. Well, people are going to look at that and say, this is ridiculous, and you're going, to, you're going to lose. You're going to just die after a while, okay? So this is what you're dealing with with Catholics. The Catholics never quite could make that connection and hold on to that connection between the earthly and, and the demands of the spiritual. And so they got swept away with the material. They got swept away by this ideology of liberalism, and that's how we're living now. Right, and they're not, they're not holding tight. Okay, so you're gonna, we're going to go back to that article. Uh-huh. Um, uh, About the feds and the sex abuse. Yeah, yeah. So why is the federal government now in, interested in child sex abuse now, is, is in this, Pennsylvania? Do you think there's a way to connect that article with uh, Trump's U.N. speech and Collins? I mean, I, I think you were... Can you try to start that? Can you see how that does connect and then, and then zero in on that? Hmm. Well, I don't know right now off the top of my head. Okay. Uh, but I know that we were talking about the connection a little bit ago, but then I got off on a rant. And so I, I know that one thing, uh, i got to have a little bit of humor here. Um, I know that one thing that we were talking about is that the church has, um, is under some fire now from the federal government, which it never was before. Right. But and this uh, is recent. This is like in the last few days. But you're... Uh, I think I mentioned I had, uh, Gus Zilke was on the show, and he was pointing out that McCarrick was uh, sent by the Pope to, um, I think he said it on the show, to help achieve some kind of peaceful resolution there in China. And uh, McCarrick was useful to the Pope, so he was trying to get, let the Pope off the hook a little bit because McCarrick was good at producing that re- um, reconciliation that was needed in China. And I think you suggested that, too, that... that that what was achieved there in China was not pleasing to the federal government. Well, this is interesting what you say. Okay, so you're talking about the uh, arrangement that was reached between the Vatican and China uh, around September 22, where the Vatican gave the Chinese government power to appoint bishops in the Catholic Church. Yeah. Now, the Pope keeps veto power, but the government appoints somebody and you're going to say, oh, no, we don't want them. Well, you just kind of tick them off. You tick off the government at that point. The whole issue of who appoints the bishops in the Catholic Church was settled in 1122, the Diet of Worms, uh, or Worms. So what happened now is you've got the church, you know, this hierarchical institution going back again on its own history by this pope 
which rejects its own doctrine of the Catholic Church, so it forgets its own history. And, and, and this has, I think, upset a lot of people that um, the church has now given control of the church in China effectively to the Chinese government. Wow, so... The Chinese government is a nationalist government. Yeah, they're communist, right? But they're a nationalist government. Uh, Bill McGurn in the Wall Street Journal a couple of weeks ago wrote an article, and he said, you know, he says, um, those Chinese, they're against the West, and they're, they're against, you know, Catholicism. Well, they should be against communism. Well, Bill McGurn doesn't get it. He doesn't get it. Um, the Chinese government uh, has put forth, uh, in 2012, it put forth a paper where it condemned liberalism, capital L, uh, liberalism, which forms the basis of all the societies in the West. And I think it's point number three. It specifically mentions liberalism is bad. Um, but it condemned all of these evils that are in the West, and the big one is liberalism, with all that that brings. Well, who's the big carrier of liberalism in the world? The Catholic Church, because the Catholic Church has accepted the American ideology. That's what my book is about. It explains how the leadership has totally accepted it. So now what you've got is you've got the leader of this giant organization, this fifth column that could be in China, you know, uh, agitating for, for liberal way of looking at things, suddenly giving control of the church over to a very nationalist, communitarian, ethnic leadership, cloaked in the image of communism, of course. So he, he, he did what he didn't really want to do. That would have been against his n normal liberalism to have to concede that to the Chinese, right? I, you know, I, it's, uh, it's a little boggling why he would do that, in a way. Um, I, I can't explain to you why the Pope would agree to that. Um, maybe he can't really even explain that either himself. But, but the result is that the, the United States and America lost um, a powerful asset in China. Because you have to understand that back in the 1950s, early 1950s, the American uh, leadership was looking at using the religions to carry American ideology around the world to include going into the communist countries. Well, in 1951, there was a People's Republic of China, and in 2018, there is still a People's Republic of China. Right. So it used to be, I mean, I've been to churches where the big message was, you know, how the communists infiltrate, like in the Philippines, you know, they, they would try to become a, a minister in the church. The communists would infiltrate. But you're saying that America did the same thing. It would try to infiltrate yeah. and, and to advance our interest. And, of course, the communists, yeah. as we were told, that they were infiltrating to advance their interest within the church. Right. That's what we're told. And, and the church it was a battleground. There probably no doubt about it. It was a battleground. Yeah. But within the Catholic Church uh, today, we see all the trouble that they're going through. Do you feel that, that the enemy has, besides the American, uh, your book on the CIA infiltrating the church, do you see anything else infiltrating the church? Um, uh, besides, like, your book pointed out, especially the CIA and the American government trying to infiltrate the church. But there's a lot of things happening, more, probably more than just that. I, I, well, from where I am, I, I, don't, I don't see a lot changing in the Catholic Church. There's a lot of... Um, there's a lot of issues revolving around this pope and the sex abuse. There we go with the sex card again. The sex abuse scandal uh, involving McCarrick and and, we're, and Weirich, um from uh, Washington D.C. Uh, just recently, um, just recently, you want to look up there, Peter. Just recently resigned. Whirl, uh, Whirl from Washington D.C. Just recently resigned. Um, so there's there's this there's this issue about sex and and um, that persists in the church, this discussion. Um, so I don't know. Maybe there's going to be some changes in the church. I, I don't know. But um, the Department of Justice now is involved, and that's very unique. And the article I'm looking at was from um, the NPR, and it talks about the Department of Justice launching an investigation of child sex abuse within Pennsylvania's Roman Catholic Church. And they're looking at it, uh, as the article talks about, in terms of RICO. Uh, which is the racketeering and corrupt Which originated... Uh, which originated right here in Notre Dame with Robert 
uh, Blakey. Yeah. He wrote it. Yeah. Right. Going so, after going after mainly the mafia, right? Well, after mafia, after gangs, they used it to go after gang. 18 U.S. Code 1961 at SEC. That's what they used to go after gangs, to go after the mafia. Now they're using it to go after the Catholic Church. Out of Notre Dame. So yeah, well, yeah, <laughs> that's because really the ironic. From Notre Dame. It is ironic. But but you know, um, you got to ask the question. Wait a minute. You got all these years of sex abuse, and it was covered up. And it's against the law to sexually abuse a minor. And that was covered up and conducted, and nobody reported it. And it's against the law to cover that up. So you got to say, is the Catholic Church a criminal enterprise? Well, maybe the Department of Justice is going gonna, is gonna to find out. They're going to do some investigation. Now, there's a five-year statute of limitations, as I could find, uh, because it's under the general statute, 18 U.S. Code 3282. But there's probably case law out there that can extend it. So what has to happen is within the last five years, there has to have been some criminal act, which could then be used to bootstrap, as I understand it, all the other previous acts. What's interesting is why this didn't occur in 2002, when all this stuff first broke and the Catholic Church promulgated its new guidelines. And to its, and to its credit, the Catholic Church did in large measure clean itself up in 15 years. But there's still some, you know, some instances of abuse, which are criminal violations, according to the Pennsylvania Grand Jury Report. So the question is, why didn't the feds step in back in 2002 and, and clean it up? You know, so that, that poses the question, is there a connection maybe between, you know, China and this? You know, I, I don't know. So that's something that is food for thought. And maybe we're going to get more information on it, and we'll be back here talking about it. But that was just your observation. I These mean, are just my observations. Just I'm just speculating at that point. But I will tell you that the, the, the RICO statute is used to prosecute corrupt organizations, criminal enterprises. And um, there's a possibility a Catholic church, at least in Pennsylvania, could be determined to be a criminal enterprise. But in all fairness, the sovereign which is the government, which is the Department of Justice, has got the right to protect its citizens. And all throughout church history, when the church strayed, you had the civil authorities step in and do what they had to do. I was just reading about Charlemagne earlier today. Charlemagne in 800 was crown emperor, the Holy Roman Empire, and he would just weigh in on theological issues. He would clean up the monastery, just like Conrad II and, and Otto III. All these guys would do that during the Holy Roman Empire. Um, and because there was corruption in the church. So this is something that keeps coming back within the history of the church. Well, it's what Pope is, uh, the Pope is dealing with in China. China feels like they should have a say. And in a sense, our federal government is having a say in uh, what's going on in the Catholic Church, but, but through a different route. In a, in a different route. But, but the, the appointment of the leadership of the church was something that was settled uh, in church history in 1122. And... Um, you know, the Americans aren't seeking to, to replace the leadership or appoint the leadership, though that may be the actual result if there's any, any criminal um, indictments issued. Um, but the Chinese are looking to actually select the leadership of the church in China um, and, and to have a say. But the Pope is violating the Council of Worms on the that. The Council of Worms, yeah, from 1122. Now, the Russian Orthodox, they, I always was under the impression they did work with the communists. So if the, and, and so they... Probably did, yeah. Right, so now the Pope is kind of doing what they were doing in, uh, in the Soviet Union. Well, I don't think the Soviet Union necessarily appointed uh, the prelates, but they may have uh, expressed uh, approval of them one way or another. But th this is China way. actually appointing them. They're actually appointing them, yeah. So that is... That, that's huge. That's a huge difference, yeah. And the Pope is allowing it. He's allowing it. So, and he, But he keeps the veto power, is what he's saying. That's As I understand it from the press reports, he keeps the veto power. And that's the, the organization, uh, as I understand it. So uh, it's a curious time in which we are. Um, can we just touch on that last article? Uh-oh. This is by David Brooks in the New York Times. He says there's a rich white civil war. Got five minutes. Smarter look at America's divide. He says that there are hidden that there was a report by a group called More in Common called Hidden Tribes, breaks Americans into seven groups from left to right. They go from traditional liberals and so on and so forth. And you've got the two groups at the extreme ends are causing all of the problems. They're the richest and the whitest of all the groups, is what he's saying. 
and um, you got you know basically they're very very conservative at one end and at the other end you know they're very liberal and what he says is very curious he says the current situation really does begin to look like the religious wars that ripped through Europe after the invention of the printing press except that our religions now wear pagan political garb which I think is a very very interesting comment so there is a great deal of um, political um, strife in America, but the result, once again, is to get people to the, to the polls to vote, and that's part of the resiliency of the system. So Dom, somehow they think if people participate, that takes the pressure off of them. Yeah, if you participate, the one percent, the the one yeah, percent of the one, of the one one tenth one percent. Yeah, it takes the pressure off, and the system stays legitimate. They feel safer, and they, they feel sure. under less attack. People aren't going to go and and drag them out of their houses or businesses or whatever. But it keeps the system functioning. Keeps the system functioning. There's there's a movie. It was just it just was replayed not too long ago with Tom Hanks. It's called Bridge of Spies. It's it's a true story. James Donovan uh, was was a lawyer and he was hired uh, by the government, probably by the CIA, to negotiate uh, the release of Gary Powers back in 1961. 62. Oh, the guy who was in the U the U two who was shot down. And and there's one scene in there at the 25 minute mark where where Tom Hanks, the lawyer, is talking to the CIA guy, and he's saying, "Okay, your name's Hoff. You're a German." My my name is Donovan. I'm Irish. Two different people in one country. What keeps? What makes that happen? He said, "I'll tell you what. How that makes that happen? What makes that happen?" He says, "We agree on the rules. We agree on the rules. That's right. Well, we're and a nation of, of law. Is, is the rule of law, and that's democracy and elections. That's part of the rules. Right. But so that's what you keep. That's how you keep the system legitimate. But are we actually a, a nation of laws? Because it seems like we violate that all the time. And what happens if the oh, people? I think we're a nation of laws. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's true. Yeah, but but the law is based on what? The Constitution? Well, <laughs> the law is, is based on uh, practicality, ultimately. Yeah, but who defines practicality? I mean, so what's called practicality this year is think, unpractical next year. So the I laws are elect- constantly changing. So we're a rule of what officials. laws? Your elected officials do, because we have, as they told us in New York when I was there at a, at a conference a couple about a month ago, they said right now we have to ensure the primacy of the political. That's right. Well, Joe Biden was speaking before a prestigious Jewish group, and he gave them credit. He says, we give you most of the credit because we were against gay marriage and because of your efforts, like the show's will and grace, American people are now pro-same-sex marriage. So isn't it the people that manipulate uh, public opinion? Uh, aren't they really? Well, you make, you make my case. You just made, you just made my case. My, um, I'm saying it's the powerful private interests. The people who have got control over the public opinion are the powerful private interests, and they own the media. And that really shapes public opinion. And then the laws will be passed based to, to uh, comply with public opinion because you'll elect somebody in Abraham and they'll Lincoln pass the that. law. Abraham they'll Lincoln change the that. law. Now, same sex marriage is all right because people have been watching Will and Grace and now they're, they're going to vote me in. And that shows the complete failure of the churches. And it, and it shows how this system completely guts the churches and guts religion. You see it with the guitars in the church. You see it with the way they worship. And the powerful private interests shape the culture. So the powerful private interests control the debate. They control the churches. Yeah. And, and um, good. Uh, this is David Wemhoff and Peter Helland on the show Citizens for Community Media. Mm-hmm.